Okay, you might have noticed we are not in the Kingside Diner right now. Uh, it's been kind of a strange day. The camera's gonna die. The computer didn't save some of my files. I'm sitting down. Uh, Mike Cummer better watch out because now Arjun's giving me Kit Kats. All in all, it's just been a kind of a weird, strange day. But uh, nevertheless, we're gonna get going. And uh, tonight, we're gonna look at uh, the Rui Lopez, and in particular, the Chigorin variation, which that's what you guys wanted to see on YouTube. So here it is, uh, I got that for you. The Brayer also came in a very close second, so hopefully within the next couple months or so, uh, we'll get to go over that as well. It's been suggested that maybe we just do like a whole month and just do all the Rui Lopez variations that are relevant, but I think that's kind of unfair, especially with the tournament that's gonna happen. Uh, like tonight that, you know, if you just play the Ray Lopez, you're going to be a, a huge advantage in that situation. But okay, we'll get it going today. Uh, we haven't talked about this opening before. So, all right, one of the most common ways to play after E4, E5. And black is usually using this approach uh, as one of the best ways to equalize. It's one of the most popular moves. And the most common way to defend the pawn is with a knight. And we've talked a little bit about D4, the scotch in the past. Um, this has been covered in some other videos on the channel. So today we're going to look at the most popular move, which is bishop to b5. And it probably looks at first like the idea is, okay, we're just going to take this and then we win a pawn. So you might be thinking black has to do something, but usually that pawn isn't in pre so early. Normally it's, it's something that you have to wait for and set up, and we'll explain why. Uh, but first we'll go over another very popular variation which is knight to f6, and this will usually lead to a, an open Roy Lopez, as opposed to the closed systems that we're going to see today. For example, very popular at the top level right now is the Berlin, and they reach this end game, uh, which after the queens are traded. Uh, you see this all the time, and some people have different opinions about this opening. Some people you know, get kind of excited. They say, wow, there's a lot of uh, rich middle game plans in this position, and they really like watching them. And other people, when they're watching you know, some big tournament, they go, oh, another Berlin ending. This is going to be boring. So very mixed uh, opinions on it. But it's an interesting way to play. So notice that the majority on the king side is going to be a lot easier for white to, in the future, make a, a queen than the doubled pawns over here. So that's one advantage. Uh, Black can castle, it's true, but you know, okay, he's got the two bishops, and he can hope for some active play, and okay, it's a, it's a completely different opening. But I bring it up mostly to mention uh, the fact that in this position, when the knight goes to d6 in lines like this, uh, the bishop is attacked. Um, and that'll be important in a second, because we'll look at lines where Black plays a6, and after the bishop retreats, well now, if there is a knight here, it's not going to go to d6 with tempo, which makes these positions a little bit different. And perhaps you're asking, OK, so why can't I just take this knight, and then I'm going to take this pawn? So we have talked about this recently, but can somebody tell me what uh, black would play in this position? Do you just blunder a pawn? Arjun. Queen d4, excellent. A double attack. Uh, so usually they save their knight, and uh, they take here. So again, it gives me what happens on what? Why don't they queen g5? Queen g5. Um, okay. So yeah, you are attacking me here, huh? And you're on my my knight. So this is interesting. Uh, I don't know. I assume I'm just gonna like protect this, and if you take here, I can play this move. Okay, it's not the only way to play, but all right, I got the center. And if queens are traded, I'm not going to get checkmated, so the fact that I lost my g-pawn shouldn't be a huge deal. But okay, but yeah, that's, that is interesting. Uh, okay, but yeah, here's the, the main point. And I get to uh, once again mention a game that was played here at the club where the very suspicious move castles was played. That was in a Knights game. Uh, the computer won't let me do it. But the guy that did it was 1,500, so he knew how to do it. He castled. And his opponent was 1,300, so he didn't know the castling rule either. Uh, so very strange that people so high rated wouldn't know that that move is illegal. And OK, after like some moves like this, it becomes clear at some point that, you know, OK. This isn't you know, a huge way for white to try to get an advantage out of the opening. So this can happen. Now you can play the exchange. The exchange variation is fine. but. Uh, in this position, you should just castle, or you could play d3, knight c3, or something. But uh, okay, castling's the main move. 
you know, you don't just take the pawn. Okay. But tonight, uh, we're going to focus on lines with a6, and we're going to keep our bishop. Uh, okay, so if in the future we might be threatening to take the knight and then grab the e pawn, so that's something that we're going to work towards. Uh, if this pawn were defended, let's say, then we would be threatening to take the knight and then take the pawn. So we'll see this. Okay, the most common move here is knight f6, attacking the pawn, and here white usually castles. Now, you can again take the pawn, but that's not what we're going to look at today. Today we're going to be focused on bishop to e7. But after knight takes e4, um, lines with rook e1 are possible, but uh, a little bit more critical is d4. And we'll just show the main variation briefly. Here, since knight to d6 doesn't attack the bishop, you have to break this pin with a pawn. And now you take, and you take with a pawn, um, not the knight, because if you take with the knight, he gets to trade this knight that's a little bit awkward. It's in front of the c-pawn. So he doesn't want to trade that. And you get a position like this. And over the next couple of moves, white will probably you know, shore up the d4 square, make sure that's protected so black can never advance. Um, he's just going to bring his knight out and his queen out, and he's going to put a lot of pressure on e4. So white should get a pretty pleasant position, but it's, it's playable, and good people have played it before. But we're going to focus tonight on bishop to e7, and black's intention is uh, just a castle. Um, it might seem a little strange, because in the future you're going to play d6. Why would you, you know, box in your own bishop? Well, in a lot of lines, we are trying to take here. And it's nice to have something that's shielding this file, so that if there's ever a rook that ends up on the e file, black might be able to get away with a little bit more because there's something in the way. But all right. So here we defend. And at last, we are finally threatening to take this and grab this guy because now the pawn is defended. So black's got to do something about that. So b5. And OK, one of the big things is, is the pawn, especially on b5, is that going to be a strength or a weakness? Is black going to get a lot of counterplay over there? Um, sometimes it becomes a liability, this pawn. So we'll see that in a lot of games. That can end up being weak, especially after some positional move like a4 and taking and trying to make this pawn weaker. Um, you have a, you know, a bishop and a queen that can attack it. And we'll see some of those themes today. White's main sources of counterplay in this opening are b5 and e5. So we'll, we'll see that. Uh, OK, now d6. We will take a look at castling, which can lead to some really exciting stuff, like the Marshall Gambit. So we're going to take a look at that when we see our first game. Uh, but OK, we're going to focus on d6 immediately. This is the, the closed Ruy Lopez. And White's intention over the next few moves is to establish a big pawn center. That's the one thing that he can argue is to his big advantage. He can get both of his pawns to the center, whereas black only got one. And it's unlikely that he'll play d5 in the near future. So also, uh, black's about to go take this bishop, which is why c3 makes sense for both reasons. Now if you attack our bishop, we have a retreat square. And OK, it might seem strange that you want to put your bishop on such a silly square. But Roy Lopez is going to be a slow positional maneuvering game. Uh, where it's going to be important to keep those bishops for later on. So, OK. Castles. And as a prerequisite for d4, white normally inserts the move h3, which prevents uh, bishop to g4. The reason is if you just play d4 right away, that allows bishop to g4. And some good people have played this variation. So, I mean, I, it's not wrong in any way. But black does usually end up getting a lot of counterplay, which is why this variation is unpopular. For example, uh, after some normal moves here, black will end up in a position where he can play either knight to c4 or c5. And he tends to get a lot of counterplay in, in these lines, which is why it's typically avoided. And white's uh, big thing in this opening is usually he's just trying to make sure black has no counterplay. He'll be a little bit better in the center. And over the course of the game, in the long run, uh, he's going to be squeezing black to death. OK. After h3, there's a ton of moves here. Today, we're going to look at knight to a5, but uh, also very common, and hopefully we get to do a video on it soon enough, is uh, the brayer. And OK, black removes his uh, knight. He goes backwards, which is kind of funny. But he's going to play knight to d7. Typically, he'll reorganize his pieces. And he may or may not play c5. Uh, when he plays, as we're going to see in the game, he's kind of committed to a strategy with c5, which is fine. OK, we, we don't want to lose our bishop, so let's move it out of the way. 
And OK, C5. Uh, it's, we could mention, too, there is a, a gambit line here. This is the Gajewski gambit, which is not very popular, but it's worth just taking a quick peek at it to see. Uh, it's very similar to the Marshall, which we'll have a look at. But here it's, you know, it's a little bit different. The main line is D4. And it's not the focus of our lecture, so you can examine all the different captures here for yourself. But the main line is to take, and we grab on E5. And White's goal is over time, he's going to go and he's going to try to win, round up this pawn. And usually that happens, but black can play very actively and try to get a lot of peace activity. Um, so we'll look at sort of the main line here. He uh, is going to put all of his pieces to attack this pawn. The queen is going to B1, which will add a third attacker. And white will ultimately be able to round up the pawn. But black is to cause them a little bit of disturbance. Here, the only move you can really play is knight to g4. And after this capture, uh, you are going to end up winning this pawn. But you can see that black has a lot of activity. Uh, he's trying to safer the pawn. You know, he might be able to bring a rook into the attack. Perhaps at some point, the queen will enter the attack. We can play a move like f5, open the f file, and get this guy into the, the action. This guy should be able to find a, a nice place coming back into the game. So it is a, a very interesting way to play, but it isn't a, a very popular variation. OK. So we'll be looking at c5. And d3 is a very playable move. It's Bill Thompson's favorite. So for people that play Bill Thompson in the audience, uh, you should prepare for that. But we're going to look at d4 here, which is the main move. And uh, all right. So this is the move we're going to be looking at today. It is still possible to not play the Chikora, and you can play the Curious variation. And this also is kind of interesting. You might get a slightly different pawn structure than you would normally expect from uh, Rui Lopez uh, in such a position. You can see that black has conceded a little bit of the center in an effort to get a lot of activity. And uh, you'll notice the pawn structure is very similar to the Benoni. So if you like to play those sorts of pawn structures, you know, this might be for you. And black might at some point get a lot of activity with his knights. And this bishop might find its way onto this diagonal. And OK, white's hoping, all right, I'm going to push in the center at some point. And so you get a very interesting game. So that's also a possible option for black that you might want to investigate on your own if you're interested in playing this way. Um, OK, but we're looking at queen to c7 tonight. And the main move here is knight to d2. And who can tell me where that knight is headed if he gets a couple more turns? Because there's a very famous Rui Lopez maneuver with the knights. Yeah. Right, yeah, so he's going to go to f1, and he's going to jump either to e3 or g3, and ultimately he's going to try to land on f5. So white is thinking usually about a kingside attack in these lines. So if you get a knight to f5, you're, you're usually doing pretty good. So that's, if he gets a couple more turns, that's where he's headed. All right. Black usually will do something now in the center to kind of stop uh, some counterplay that he has. He'll take, and he'll go back, putting pressure on the center. And white wants to be careful whenever he plays d5. Sometimes black can get a lot of activity pretty easily. For example, here we can attack the bishop. And if you save your bishop, we're going to reroute the knight to c5, where both of these knights will be looking pretty good, for example, uh, after some normal continuation. Black has a lot of activity, so he's gotten some counterplay. And this is what happens when they play d5. It's, it's very typical, but you just want to make sure you understand when you do play d5 that, OK, black might end up getting a lot of counterplay. Which is why normally in this position, they keep the tension. Uh, white will put his knight on b3. And white, black does have a plan here. He's going to go dislodge the knight. But white has just enough time to get this move in. And OK, now the d-pawn is sufficiently defended. And we'll get to our starting position in just a couple of moves here. The bishop stays on this diagonal, where it still has control over f5. And the rook comes into the game. And OK, so the queen moves over. And this is sort of the starting variation for tonight's lesson. So if you're playing in the tournament, and it looks like we've got a, a pretty good showing tonight, maybe uh, this will be the starting position. So we'll go ahead and we'll check out a couple games now. All right, so this first game is a game between Alexander Goloshchapov and Alexei Shirov. And I thought this was uh, quite a nice game played by, by Black here. And we'll get right to it. And we'll look at it from Black's point of view this time. OK, so we'll get back to our position. 
And okay, in this position, so we know d6 is uh, the main move here in a second here. But okay, he castles. So instead of playing d6, he castles, which does allow uh, a martial gambit. So black can sometimes sacrifice a pawn with d5, which is why white players often avoid this, not playing the move c3. But okay, they might play a move, uh, sorry, like a4 or h3, and play will be a lot different. But in this game, his opponent allows the marshal, but Shirov was just joking. He, he played d6. Uh, it's worth looking into this line because it's very aggressive stuff. So what is this? Aren't you? You're losing a pawn here. After the capture, you get to pick up the e pawn. Um, all right, so this is a, a very famous position that, uh, okay, Levon Aronian is the big proponent of this now. You'll see at the top level, they're still kind of arguing over whether this is playable or not. Most games end up being a draw on this line, even though it gets really sharp right away. And if you're unfamiliar with this position, you can get crushed pretty quickly. And there was a game between Capablanca and Marshall, and it's said that Marshall prepared this position for like 10 years before he played it against Capablanca. And when he finally played it, he still lost. Capablanca was good. Uh, and he, in that game, he played knight to f6. And over time, the moves knight to f6 and bishop to b7 have kind of gone away. And the popular trend now is c6. We won't go too much into it, but okay, that protects the knight. And what's going on? Why, why did we go down a pawn here? How are we going to get our attack going? Well, we're going to get this guy into the game, and quickly a lot of pieces can get here into the attack. So we'll attack the rook, and when it goes back, queen to h4. Uh, this pretty much, pr pr you have to play g3. If you play h3, we are going to sacrifice, and it should work. So we'll take this, and this should be a, a terminal position. Uh, black should be able to win here. And it's funny, uh, whatever computer we have here, I was analyzing with Danny Machuca, who's not here, so we can talk about him. Uh, and it said either this move had to be played or f4. But then I went home and I asked Stockfish, and it, I, f4, and it just started laughing at me. And it's like, and it announced mate, and it's like, this is terrible. And then it wouldn't tell me the line, so I don't even know it. It's like, I, you can't play f4. Okay, but if you have to play this move, then you can see something's kind of gone wrong, and black's going to bring his rooks in, and this should be a, a losing position. Okay, so not h3, but g3. And here's the main move. You can see black is going to start to get a lot of activity here kind of quickly, um, the other rook's coming in. Occasionally you play f5, f4. So it's pretty dangerous for white. And so the thing is, white has to play a lot of good defense. So these are kind of really interesting positions to study if you want to do so on your own. Because it, it teaches you how to mix defense uh, with the initiative. So I really recommend that if you're interested, you take a, a look at these positions. And I'll just show the main line, which is definitely not the only way that this position can be played. But just to show the basic scheme, the queen is nicely placed where she can always go back if need be. And sometimes if there's a rook that ends up over here, uh, the knight will be able to go back and defend the h2 square. So, of course, not the only way to play. And the bishop's going to come back to f5. And you get a position like this where white has survived the attack, but black still has a bunch of pressure for the pawn. And normally it's... You know, a very interesting game. There's always some crazy stuff that might happen. A lot of different things could happen in between this line and what you might see in the game. But it seems like to be a pretty equal and balanced game based on the, the most recent Grandmaster practice. Okay. We will return. Yeah, so in the game, his opponent allowed the marshal. And he's playing Alexei Shirov, who's known for really aggressive style and a very tactical person, but uh, he decided to enter in the closed Ruy Lopez here. Okay. So we prevent bishop to g4, and we go after the bishop, c5. All right. d3, of course, is playable. We're looking at this move tonight, and after we get back to our position, we kick the knight around, uh, we'll look at this position here. Now, the most common move was played and that's queen to e2. One of the reasons is he's going to do something with this guy. This guy is going to have to go somewhere to get off of the c file so that the rooks can use the file. And in this game, his opponent tried to go to d3. And all right, rook to e8 makes a little bit of sense. Sometimes uh, if 
it might be black that might be able to take here. Sometimes it's white that will end up taking here. But it's important to have a rook on the e-file to kind of protect uh, the e5 square, which we've talked about as one of the main sources for white to get his counterplay. And, okay, this bishop is either going to go back just to be out of the way, or the bishop's going to come over and try to trade itself for its counterpart that's a little bit more active. Because, all right, the bishop might not be doing something, especially in lines where they play d5. Uh, the bishop might want to go exchange itself so he's not stuck behind all these pawns. Okay, so this is kind of his point. So now you got to protect your pawn. And in lines like these, uh, black is always thinking about getting some counterplay like this. So if it's his turn again, he might go to b4, and that's why white decided to play the move a3. And it's interesting. Normally white will do something on the queen side. Either he's going to play a3 and protect his dark squares, or he'll end up playing b3, which we'll see in the next game. And b3 scores a lot better when you're in these positions, uh, you're playing lines with b3. Because usually it's you know the knight that you're trying to keep out of some of these squares. So just from you know personal experience and games that I've seen, uh, okay, lines with a3 don't always work out well for the first player. But all right. Here he takes. So now it's black that decides to do something in the center. And he has taken on an isolated D pawn. So in the future, this could be a weakness, but he's hoping that he'll get a lot more activity than his opponent. You know, his knights are now springing to good squares. And there is a little bit of congestion in the white camp. You know, this knight still hasn't gotten out of there. Uh, what's going to happen? Okay. So the bishop was attacked, so it retreated. B4. He's trying to get some activity over on the queen side. And now a uh, bad move was already played. So this next move is very dubious positionally. He takes, and now black gets lots of pressure on the B file. And he continued with some rather strange play. Somehow he should be trying to sacrifice his B pawn and get some activity with his pieces. This is something that happens all the time in these lines. One, one of the players is not always white, but white or black sometimes sacrifices a pawn to get more activity, and sometimes that ends up being the case that he, he ends up with a, a good enough position that he can sack a pawn. But, uh, okay, rook to c2 was played. Very strange, and he is in a little bit of trouble. Uh, okay, maybe he's hoping, well, if I just get a few more turns, I can put my bishop here. Maybe I can, you know, head towards f5. Sometimes I'll play g4 and then reroute my knight in here. But uh, black has the move, and he has a chance to do something really powerful here. So it would be interesting to ask, because I've asked a couple people this week about this position and what they would play, and it's not going to shatter your brains with you know, what he played. It's not going to be like, wow, that's the greatest thing I've ever seen. Uh, it's kind of a simple move, but it would be interesting to see if the audience can figure out what black played here. He has one move to give him a big advantage. And the camera is going to die at some point. So we've got to be quick. Yes. Okay, this is the, the second most common way. And black probably has a, a very tiny advantage in this line. So this move and the move that was actually played are the, the two best moves. But there's an even stronger move. Yeah. Okay, so you're going to go back. Okay, so yes, I can either take, I can just move my knight. Um, it would be funny if we, we repeated. That would be the funny way to play. <clears throat> yeah? The knight on c6? If it's, yeah, if it's, you know, white's turn. That's why I'm always dancing around. Yeah, so it's white's turn is hanging. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll give you the solution here. So you can pause your video at home if you haven't figured it out yet. But uh, Alexei Shirov, he decided d5. Okay, just a good, strong move. He's getting rid of his weakness. And if white takes, he's going to bring the knight to a really good square. So he didn't take it. He decided he'd play f4. Black retreated, a very innocent-looking move. But Shirov is a tricky guy. 
So there are some, some sneaky tactics that are going to come up very shortly here. White played e5, and now uh, a rather beautiful move was played here. We'll see if uh, the audience can work it out. So again, you might want to pause your video, see if you can figure this one out. What did black do here? It is a tactic. Awesome. Knight takes f4, which is hoping to remove the defender. Now, he didn't uh, end up taking it. He just moved his queen. If you take, the point is, uh, we're taking this knight with check. What are you going to do? Um, if you block this way, there's a, there's a lot of things that we can do. What's kind of cool is you can even ignore what's going on, because if, if you take this, uh, you might run into some trouble in certain lines here. Uh, okay, because if you take with the queen, then your rook would be hanging. If you don't take with your queen, then your queen is hanging. So some interesting stuff can happen. Uh, you can also trade, and after either way, you can, again, trade or not trade. And you can even, there's some like clever moves here that your computer will find. Uh, perhaps bishop to d8 with the idea of if you take, uh, I'm playing here. So there's a lot of clever little tactics that might be going on in this position. And his opponent decided, all right, I'm not going to take it. I don't want to give you my bishop and allow some of those complications. Okay, he went back. And now what's going on? You have two pieces hanging. So how can that be good? Uh, so black said, okay, I'll play here. And you, the tempting move, the first move you, you may consider is g4. But this move actually loses. So black had to figure all of this complicated stuff out you know, before he went in for this line, because obviously we can't just like move our knight and then we'll end up losing a piece. So he has to play uh, a bishop move. And what's funny is if you ask your computer, every legal bishop move wins. It doesn't matter what you do. Uh, they all win. And my computer couldn't figure it out. I let it think about this position for like an hour last night, and he's like, just every bishop move is the same. They just all win. Uh, it couldn't figure it out. Okay. But perhaps the most testing and objectively the best move is uh, bishop to h4, where after you take, uh, we throw in this check. Wherever you go, we grab this. And there's, there's some problems here for you. If you just take the bishop, for example, this move is actually quite strong. You're threatening not only to take this pawn, but you're also threatening to take this knight and exploit the pin here. So there's quite a lot of threats. So the best move actually is rook to c7. And, okay, check. A very interesting move. Removing the defender. And, okay, you get a position like this where you can't take the bishop still because I'm taking here, and then, okay, here looks pretty strong. So you have to be pretty, uh, pretty careful here. So this, and it's a lot to, to work out in your head. Also possible and more aesthetically pleasing is the move bishop to d6, after which... You were used to be hanging two pieces, but now you're hanging three. So, quite clever. Uh, all right, so we should take this. If we take here, the point is a rook takes bishop. Uh, and you're in, you're in a little bit of trouble here. We can even just uh, simplify and get some material back after a position like this. And black is much better. He has more material, and his pawns have a... Uh, these pawns are looking pretty good. So you got to be careful with those guys. All right, so what you really should play in this position uh, is to take this knight. And again, it's, it's some very complicated stuff. And there are a lot of cute lines, but I'll just show one line. Uh, normally, whenever he gets to take this pawn, then he's doing really well because the rook's going to make a lot of threats soon. So here he just cleans it up. And this is still quite a messy position. So it would have been interesting to know what exactly uh, Shirov intended to play had g4 shown up on the board. Uh, also strong, you know, it's fun to play around with all these other moves on your computer. So it's, it's interesting. I don't know which one he would have played. And they're all so complicated, and you're going to get some messy position. It, so we'll never know what he would have played. Uh, but his opponent wisely did not go in for that and played instead rook to c7. So you can, again, you can, you can play like the young gentleman in the front of the room. Uh, this is the second best move. But he's a tricky guy. So he played another really tricky move here, and it, was, it leads to some complications. Uh, he played bishop to c5. Okay, you don't have to take that bishop, 
but he decided to take it. And what's going on now? It looks like this knight is about to make any discovery at once. So has Sheriff blundered? Is there some really good knight discovery? Well, he went in for one. Okay, this is a good move, right? The queen is attacked. It looks like you're going to just go pick up this knight. Things are going to be fine for you. But it's actually not that easy. Uh, he moves his queen around. You can consider the desperado. But what's more important here is time. Because in the end of this line, he's going to want to be able to pick up the B pawn. And we'll see why that's so important in the game continuation. So, knight to e6. The queen moves over. And now a lot of material is going to come off the board. And then we're going to understand what's going on. All right, so the knight was taken. Uh, queens are traded. And you can take back either way. He took with the knight just so that, okay, the rook is on the same file as his pawn here. Uh, your knight is hanging. So you make some trades. And in the end of it, you get to pick up this B pawn. And this end game is winning for black. The problem for white, of course, is this pawn. It's going to do this, and then you lose. So white tried his best, but it's, it's over now. It's just a, a technical task for the, the grandmaster here. A bishop to e6, a nice safe square. And it's kind of nice that your bishop is on one of the squares that the pawn needs to go to. And there's really just not a whole lot that you can do. And I quite like what he did here. Because you can just play this move and this will just win. But he played even more accurately, which is something that I try to get all my students to do. Just because you're, you're winning, you still want to play the most accurate moves. If for no other reason, that your game will be more aesthetically pleasing. And you should all be chess artists and play the best move in every position. And here he played a really nice move, rook to b4. And it highlights the fact that this guy is kind of trapped. He's not going back this way. And, okay, if you go to g5, for example, uh, your bishop is trapped because this rook is, is right here. And if you go back to either square back here, then this move is going to cause you some headaches. Uh, you can defend this, but now I'm going to push, and I'm threatening to take this and then make a queen. So a very nice move. It uh, provoked the move g. And only now does he go to the third rank and cause some, some problems here. Okay, so the bishop went back. And black got his last piece into the game. Uh, there's, and then even here, he played the most accurate move. Okay, there's a lot of rook moves that are going to win here. But I like this one because you're going to see in just a minute, if the knight ever goes to d1, you can just snatch it up and take this guy. Over here. And after this move, he gave it up. So yeah, very interesting uh, display of tactics. And that's what happens so often in the Roy Lopez. It's a positional battle. And then suddenly, when tactical things happen, they can get wild and crazy. So it's not just a, a boring opening from start to finish. All right, we'll have a look at one more game here. And OK, this time, we'll take a look at it from White's perspective here. And this is the game between Topalov and Ivanchuk from the Amber Rapid in 2011. So it was a rapid game, so they were moving pretty quickly. But we'll take a look at it. All right, we'll get back to our position here. All right. Are you familiar with this guy walking in the room? No? Do you play the Brayer? Is that your thing? No? I thought that's what you played. What do you play? Oh, okay. Um, all right, so here's our position. And we saw Queen E2 in the last game. Here White tries to do something a little bit different. Uh, he goes back. Uh, and it's worth mentioning, too, one more thing about this line, but only if I can remember. Uh, let's see. There are some lines where what, what really boring things happen. Sometimes in these lines, uh, let's see, let's just put this guy here and here. Uh, I didn't mention it in the other video, but sometimes white just like gives up and like basically forces a draw here. Uh, you can capture everything and like trade these guys. And then you can either take or you can not take. And they get to this really boring position. And, OK, most of these games have always been draws. And Akobian has been on the black side here. And he played a couple moves, and then, then it was a draw. So you can be really boring if you want as white, if you, if you want to draw. Because you guys are pretty grandmasterly in the audience. And you, if you need your draws, that's the way to do it. But, OK, so we'll go back. And instead, we'll look at uh, bishop to b1. And he'll use a little bit of a different strategy in this game. Uh, you'll see that the moment. Uh, the knight goes to a5. 
black is going to play the move b3, which is what we kind of talked about. So instead of a3 this time, he's going to defend his light squares on the queen side. And in my personal opinion, this is one of the better ways to play. So, all right. We see this maneuver again, right? He's trying to get rid of the bishop trapped behind the pawns, which is what he's going to look to do whenever white plays the move d5. And here, bishop to d3, sort of a tricky move. His point is he's going to play b4. The knight's going to have to jump into c4, and he'll take the knight, forcing an isolated pawn. And black doesn't have to allow this. He could say, take this and just play b4 himself. And then the variation that happens in the game wouldn't have happened. But he decides to allow it, which, OK, fair enough, b4. So the, the big question in this position, it, it might look like, OK, you're just losing a pawn, but uh, you can't grab the pawn right now. And we'll, we'll try to understand why. Black actually has a way to regain the pawn here. After taking the rook, forcing the rook to go back, he can get rid of all of the bishops, and his queen will be able to take back on b4. So we'll take everything, and we'll take it back. And then if anything, it's black that's better here, but it's not by much. So that's why he didn't just grab this pawn. So you're not winning a pawn. And the big question here is, OK, are we going to be able to win this pawn, or is this going to be a strong, annoying passed pawn? And OK, in the game, it turned out it was uh, more of a weakness than a strength. So here, a3. He, uh, he realized he didn't want to go. He didn't want to lose his b pawn. Now he is threatening to take the pawn, so it was defended. And now he's going to slowly build pressure on the c pawn. Uh, so we can imagine this is kind of fun for white. You know, he's the one that's going to build the pressure and have the more active pieces. So all right, the knight is coming into f4. You gave away the dark squared bishops. So OK, we want to be looking at the f4 square. Uh, all right. And he slowly builds. And here it comes. All right. And then at some moment, you know, uh, we're going to move the queen. and Perhaps we're going to put our knight on d2. And we're going to just put a lot of pressure on this pawn. It hasn't turned out to be a hindrance to the white player at all. But OK. F6. So Danny showed up, so we had to play F6. You like it? All right. As usual, it's not the best move, but all right, it's some, it's some legal move. And at one point, he jumped in. So at the proper moment, we get to keep that knight out. So is that knight doing something in here? Is it, is it bothering white? Uh, or will there ever be a tactical opportunity to take the knight and then take one of the rooks that's not protected? Who knows? Um, OK, now the problem for black is he's so tied up on the queen side that White can actually launch a surprisingly effective attack on the king side. He's using two knights and a queen, and you don't have a lot of defenders over there. And here it worked out really well for him. Uh, okay, so he defended his pawn, and all right, this is not not very easy for him. Uh, what should he do? And here he played sort of an interesting move. He's he is allowing a, a sacrifice here. He's giving up a pawn with check. Uh, what could he be thinking? Well, now the knight is trapped. So white is committed to sacrificing, but good thing he's winning. So this is a good sacrifice. And yeah, the king is, is just really naked on the king side over here. There's not a lot that he can do. He uh, brought a bishop back. And in this position, uh, he resigned. So yeah, this move is coming, which is pretty strong. And the problem is if you defend against it, uh, well, now there are some tactical liabilities with this knight. So we can check, per se, and then take this. And OK, you're losing a piece, and you're playing a grandmaster. And all right, so that's why he, uh, he resigned there. So yes, yeah, so that's a little bit about the Roy Lopez and how you should play with it as both colors there. Uh, it would be interesting. We've done e4 quite extensively in the, the past few weeks here. So it would be nice to get some d4 openings, maybe, or something a little more offbeat. And a lot of you have been saying the openings I pick are too good. You know, it's the main line, everything. Uh, you guys want like a nonsense episode. So perhaps reluctantly, I'll have to, you know, bring the box back and we'll do an episode with just all bad openings and Danny will be happy. People at home will be happy and I'll be crying the whole time because I'll be so upset that I have to do it. But all right, once in every 20 episodes, we got to do something nonsense. So 
send in your submissions for that. And as always, uh, please like, share, subscribe. And a okay, big shout out to uh, Logic and Morality. I just figured out what Reddit was the other day and he posted my thing, so that was pretty cool. Uh, so keep doing that. My, my fans have been doing a pretty good job sharing me around. And I'll see you guys next week. <laughs>